So that brings us to the lesson where we actually defined Gauss's law that was formulated by a German mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss, one of the greatest ever. And here we'll understand the simplicity and power of his law. Well, before we go ahead, let us solve a small problem that will help us cement our understanding of the last lesson and also make sense of Gauss's law a lot quicker. So what we have here is a sphere of radius r that encloses a charge of value plus q at the center of it. Now the question for you is what is the electric flux passing through the sphere? So a couple of things you'd wish to note right away are the surface is not flat and the electric field also varies as you move away from the charge. But since the charge is at the center, we can say that the electric field is directed radially outwards at every point of the sphere surface and is therefore perpendicular to the surface. Or in other words, each field vector is parallel to the area vector through which it comes out. So we can say that E dot dA is equal to E dA cos 0 which equals E dA and this would be true for every dA element you take across the sphere's surface. Now this makes things simpler for us when we use this equation for finding the flux because we can see when we put E dot dA as E dA we can take E out on the right hand side since E is constant at radius r and what we are left with is E times integral of dA. Well, integral of dA is nothing but the area of the sphere itself that is 4 pi r square. So we can say that the total flux value is equal to Ea which equals Q upon 4 pi epsilon r square into 4 pi r square which equals q upon epsilon naught. So some interesting observations you can make are that the radius r cancels off and therefore the flux value has no dependence on the radius value. In other words the flux would be the same at any radius value small or large. So it's quite like what we showed in the first lesson where instead of a sphere we had a rectangular box and showed that doubling the size of the box did not change the flux value at the surface of the two different boxes. So to extend this logic the flux value remains the same at the surface of any shape that may enclose a given charge. I repeat and this is a very important statement so you got to hear it a little closely the flux value remains the same at the surface of any shape that may enclose a given charge. So let us now go ahead and study Gauss's law which I would say is quite the same as Coulomb's law. It is just that Gauss has shown the relationship between charge and field in another useful way. So Gauss's law simply says that the total flux through a surface that encloses a certain volume is directly proportional to the value of the total net charge enclosed by the surface. So we just saw that in case of the sphere the value of flux is proportional to the value of the charge inside the sphere. So even if we took a larger sphere around this charge the flux value through it would remain the same and that would also be true for any irregular surface that may enclose the charge. So Gauss's law therefore can be written for any surface enclosing a charge as follows. Electric flux is equal to the surface integral of dot product of E and dA which equals Q upon epsilon naught. Or in other words the flux through any surface that encloses a charge is equal to the value of the net charge inside the surface divided by epsilon. Here we use the term net charge to mean that the surface can enclose n number of charges negative or positive 
all we need to do is find the net charge by adding up the value of all charges and E in this equation is the net total field at each point on the Gaussian surface. So if the surface encloses no charge or the net charge inside is zero, the value of flux through the surface also becomes zero. Also remember that such surfaces called the Gaussian surfaces are imaginary surfaces. So let's move ahead and ask ourselves what if the charge inside was minus Q instead of plus Q? Well, you'll observe that in such a case, the electric field E through each DA element will be pointing inwards and would be at an angle of 180 degrees with area vector DA and the value of E dot DA would equal absolute value of E times DA times cos 180, which equals minus Q upon 4 pi epsilon R square DA. So the integral becomes minus Q by epsilon naught. So you see, to find the net flux through any surface, you just need to put the value of the net charge with a proper sign here and you'll get the net flux. Another thing you may like to note is that the E value at any point on the surface could be a contribution from a charge inside the surface as well as charge outside the surface. But you got to remember that flux contribution from any charge outside the surface is always zero as far as the total enclosed surface is concerned. So let us take a situation where we have two charges inside a Gaussian surface like this. One is plus Q and the other is minus Q. What we would say is that the net flux through the surface is zero since the net charge is zero. You add plus Q and minus Q, you get zero. Well, we could have also said that the number of field lines going out of the surface due to charge plus Q is the same as the number of field lines coming into the surface due to charge minus Q and hence the net flux is zero. But if we were to consider this as a Gaussian surface, we would say that the net flux through this surface is plus Q upon epsilon naught because this surface encloses charge plus Q only. While if we take this as the Gaussian surface, flux would be uh, minus Q upon epsilon naught because this surface encloses charge minus Q. And finally, if we take this as a Gaussian surface, what would you think should be the flux value through this surface? Well, it'll be zero simply because it has no charge inside the surface. So if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and please do not forget to subscribe to this channel for many more interesting videos.